Hi, this is Phil Spencer, and you're listening to the Inner Circle Podcast. For the fans, by the fans. Welcome back, Brad. Glad to have you on again to talk about uh, GDC and um, your new game, Ashes of a Singularity, uh, which was mighty impressive at GDC, according to reports, with the sheer number of objects on screen at once. Let's talk about that. Um, what is Ashes about, and how has DX12 helped you design the game? Oh, sure, and it's great to be back. Um, so Ashes of Singularity is a very large-scale real-time strategy game where you are fighting over, you're fighting through a galaxy planet by planet. So I mean, literally, a given map is a particular planet. Uh, so you're seeing entire mountain ranges and deserts, and you know the it's the full array as if you're fighting for an actual terrestrial uh, map. Wow. And uh, so as a result of trying to give that bring in that scale, we uh, we're showing thousands and thousands of different units on screen at the same time. You know, I've seen some people look at a screenshot and go, well, that's no bigger than, you know, insert their favorite game. And what they don't realize is that, yes, but that, that screenshot is just is one battle. That's not mm. the battle. That is one of, say, 30 battles that might be taking place oh, wow. simultaneously on the map. And um, even at the show, we were showing off on the s smallest possible map in order to ensure that they, uh, they make it easy enough to demo, right? Because on a large map, it can take an hour to travel across the map. It's uh, a little harder to demo a bunch of battles if you're having to zip around that many, that much screen real estate. But anyway, uh, it has. Uh, it takes place in our future, and uh, you're you're basically f uh, battling with what we call constructs, which are uh, these huge battleship and cruiser. It's kind of like Sins of the Solar Empire on a planet, where you're sending off these units to fight each other to take control of the planet by uh, annihilating the other opponent. Hmm. That's hmm. very interesting. Now, how has DX12 helped you design it? We know, I guess that's a CPU bound game, correct? It is. I mean, and the game has been developed with DirectX 11 in mind because we can't okay. assume everyone's going to be running D DirectX 12. So, right. Yeah, um, well, that's smart. <laughs> yeah. So, one of the things that there's a lot of interesting things that people don't think about when they play computer games or, or console games because they're so used to limitations of games in terms of how we look at when I look at a game real time when you look at it, and it doesn't matter what kind of game it is it could be a PC or a console game you can tell it's a video game right no mm -hmm. one ever goes and looks at it and goes oh that's a CGI movie right they right and that has to do with the way uh, light is handled and materials are handled and lots of other stuff it has nothing to do with the number of polygons or um, or anything that a lot of other people tend to think it has to do with. It's usually how many light sources you have and how objects interact with light. And what DirectX mm. uh, 12 will allow us to do, so DirectX 11 allows us to have thousands of units on the screen simultaneously, but we have to do some some stuff to make sure that the performance is good. Right. On DirectX 12, we're able to show those units and with a fidelity that you normally would only see in a, in a CGI movie. Mm. Um, as, so that, <laughs> as an example, every single shot in the game. So if you have thousands of units, you can imagine how many shots are being fired. Right. In terms of plasma, weapons, or rail guns, or mm -hmm. explosions. Every single one has a light source. So you're not talking... Uh, <clears throat> last time I was on, I, talk, I had mentioned that uh, most engines only support four... Uh, discrete light sources, right? And so one of your someone online said, "Well, he's an idiot." I happen to know that on a PlayStation Four, you can have eight. Like, okay, fine, <laughs> eight. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, Ashes Singularity might have three thousand <laughs> of wow. them, right, going at the same time. And those are wow. the kinds of things that, and it's not gratuitous. If you look at the room you're in right now, how many light sources are there? I you know, reflecting off of different things. I bet you it's more than four or eight. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And yeah. that's the sort of thing that people notice, even if they don't consciously notice. When you're looking at, a, say, a Pixar movie or a, a modern CGI movie, those are the things that make it not look like a video game, is that there's lots of different things bouncing off these things. It's not ray tracing still, but it's much... You, you can just sense that it feels like things are right. Right. Question. Does uh, you spoke of ray tracing, and you know I've seen a lot of people talk about ray tracing coming to consoles. Um, do you see that happening with, uh, especially on Xbox with DX12? Does DX12 have a ray tracing application? Uh, well, not in real time. Um, it's ray tracing in my, and this is just my opinion, and I'm, I'm sure there will be people who disagree, but it is the ultimate example of perfect being the enemy of good, and that mm -hmm. is you can. Ray tracing, in theory, could deliver a perfectly realistic scene. And it would cost a gajillion times more in CPU power than doing it using a number of uh, existing te uh, techniques like object-based rendering or, or what have you, where you get 99% the same at a tiny fraction of the cost. Hmm. Gotcha. Mm. Gotcha. Let me give you an example of ray tracing, right? If I have a reflective light... Uh, let's say I have a whiteboard and it has a glass surface. With ray tracing, the light hits that and then it will bounce off and hit something else and then hit something else and hit something else. But as a practical matter, you can't tell. You don't need to remodel the light that reflected off the glass, reflecting off another thing, reflecting off that onto something else and so on. Right? At some point, you just can't tell. Right. So, you know, we, we've heard you and read some things about you talking about how some of the tools were being updated for Xbox, um, as well as PC, as we start to go into the release of DX12 this year. Um, and one of them, one of the topics that was brought up was the whole ES RAM debate, which is something you spoke about last time you was on the show. Um, and obviously, we all know that Microsoft has had its issues with resolution, though understand that resolution is not the most important things when it comes to games. It's about gameplay. It's about being able to play those games with a steady frame rate. To me, in my opinion, those are the most important things. Resolution is a nice icing on the cake, obviously. Um, and I really cringe when people say, oh, well, if that was the case, we could still have Xbox 360s. Well, we still have PS3s. No, there's a big difference. <laughs> okay, this it's just because you know the, the the game doesn't support full HD 1080p doesn't mean that you can just play the same games that you did on 360. There's a big difference in texture quality. It's a big difference in objects on screen, um, in general. But but, however, well, uh, well, the Wii U does 1080p. So hey, right. why don't we just well, you know, why even get a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox One? Just go yeah, get a Wii yeah. U and uh, was... do your 1080p and call it a day. Right, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was playing exactly. Wii U. Be done. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in a nutshell, um, you brought up something called PIX, P-I-X, and um, this is something that some fans have heard of, some fans probably have not heard of, um, and it is supposed to help the ES RAM or shall I say, help developers use the ESRAM um, in the best way possible by avoiding um, the traps of the bottleneck and, and get it to the point where it's supposed to more efficiently. Could you explain what that is more clearly for fans? Sure. So the, one of the big debates that developers and other techie, and techies have on the Internet is Microsoft's choice to use DDR3 or its memory... <laughs> on the Xbox One. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I think it was dumb for them to do that. I thought it was really, really short-sighted. I I wouldn't be surprised if someone at Microsoft lost, got in mm. some serious trouble mm. for that. Yeah, that decision, yeah. Yeah, mm. that was really boneheaded. But they tried, what they did is they said, well, we'll use DDR3, but we'll have a little tiny bit of memory. Of, I think it's uh, 32 megabytes of yeah. memory that is really fast. And what the developers can do is... Uh, use that. So when they pick what they need to get to the screen really fast in a given frame and put it through that. But 32 megabytes is not very much. And, right, and especially nowadays. Right, right. right. So picking the right things to, to put on there is not easy. And in DirectX 11 
And just in a current gen, all the games right now, there there's been a lot of difficulty in using it optimally, right? Mm. I mean, especially in the mountain, everyone's always under crunch, and uh, it's really hard, even under the best of circumstances, to optimize your performance. And previously, direct, with, especially with DirectX 11, it was a pain in the butt to use that little piece of memory well. So with DirectX 12, Microsoft's basic, I asked them this and at, at some length at the show because I didn't, because I mean, I, people go crazy. I, I see, I will mention something online and people will pick it apart. And so I right. try to be really careful and I asked them at length. Just so I understand, you're not just updating this API. And they said, no, we're basically redoing it for DirectX 12. The APIs that let you manipulate and use the SRAM. Mm. Um, so it's, but I haven't seen, but the problem is I, I go online, I can't find any coverage or details of this API. But I, I mean, I was, I talked to the guy who did the driver and I don't have his card on me, but I mean, it's the guy. <laughs> like, you know, a guy at Microsoft who's in charge of this, right. and uh, and it, and he was showing me pics, and he says, you know, the big thing about the new version of Pix is that it does makes it way easier for you to optimize this stuff because you can do it in real time within your game. You don't have to go ahead and previously, apparently, you had to try out try putting things through SRAM. If it didn't, it wasn't fast enough. You exited the game. Load up the compiler, <laughs> try wow. something else, you know, and go through it. You know, try it was total trial and error. Whereas now, Pix will let you kind of do it in real time. It will try to, to automate some of this, and um, as a result, it should be a lot easier for uh, developers to do you know, to, to get the most out of it. That's mm. one of the things I see online is people say, "Oh, it's not SRAM. You just can't do 1080p on the Xbox," which I brings me back. to the point of, of course you can. I mean, the Wii U does 1080p, right? right. I mean, at the, that, that's your that's your response automatically, right? The Wii U mm-hmm. does it. Obviously, the Xbox One. Heck, the Xbox One could probably do it if you're just using DDR3. If your if your scene is simple enough. Right, 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 right. I think that's the thing. I think fans feel that oh, uh, you know, we know that it can do 1080p, um, and 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 the first thing you see is yeah, well, because it's not a lot happening in that screen on that screenshot or it's not a lot happening in the game or it's not, you know, graphically intensive with using up a lot of resources. And the question is, will this help the ES RAM? And and also added with that, they always bring up tower resources, you know, about a, a while back Microsoft showing how you could put um I think it was what four or five gigs of of data into like I don't know 32 megabytes of information and you send it through or something like that there's a lot of things you can do uh with if you're, you're talking using compression right and there's yeah. a lot of, exactly there's a lot of you're zipped to come uh, uh a bitmap right i'm just on your hard drive load up a bitmap zip it right or turn it into a png right, right. png is just a, a zip of a bitmap basically um and it's you can get 90 percent of it down Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of interesting things that become possible if you if you're clever. It, it's always been a matter of well, yes. It, it, if you're willing to spend the time, you can pretty much do anything. But most developers are on a tight schedule. How much effort are they going to be willing to do? That's why I've always said the API. Uh, and you've seen this countless times, right? With past consoles, where if the console is a pain in the butt uh, the, the, to get the most out of, you're just not. Gonna get I mean, the PlayStation the, uh, 3 had a cell processor, right? It could do all kinds of crazy stuff. There mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, but you never saw anybody really get that much out of it. Except for the the first-party developers themselves. Yeah, they except use for the hardware. They use the hardware that much. Um, I think, yeah. I, I feel the same way. I feel like the, the first-party companies for Microsoft are going to be the ones that get the most out of DX12 because they're the ones that's going to know how to use it they're the ones working with the hardware. They're the ones that can get the engineers fastest um, for for their games. And I think third parties. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, you you have some guys stepping up, and I'll let Brandon talk bring it up in a second. But um, you know, you have third parties coming in now and starting to talk about DX12. Uh, recently, I believe it was uh, the guy from Frostbite who felt that it should be adopted. 100 percent by every developer oh yeah um, just to get the adoption rate out there as fast as possible and have people upgrade 
to Windows 10. Um, and yes, that would isolate, that would obviously isolate some people who don't want to upgrade to Windows 10. They still want to stick with Windows 7, maybe Windows 8, and still play their games. But if you don't have the Windows 10 platform, then you won't be, be able to play under his theory. Now, that's just a thought that he put out there. Um, but again, going back to the ES RAM, obviously the question is now with with picks help if these guys decide to go with the tower resource route do you think that this whole resolution thing will finally be over in my opinion is minor but it's still such a hot subject you know among so many people um in the consumer space you think that they finally found a way to to get that shut down because I remember actually sorry <laughs> I, I remember that guy from CD Projekt Red said that it just wasn't enough shaders on the Xbox one to do 1080p so is that a concern oh uh, well I, I don't know why I remember I've, I've been able to do 1080 I've been able to do 2560 by uh, you know, 1440 on a PC with like hardware that is you know, for how many years right I mean there are this is going to come as a shock, but PC users have been doing 1920 by 1080 for a decade. And right. the hardware, and we're talking hardware that is, especially in terms of shaders or whatever, are nowhere near what's on the Xbox. I mean, obviously, a modern PC blows away a modern, you know, the consoles today, but I'm talking 10 uh, Since the Solar Empire was doing 2560 by 1440 back in you know, uh, 2007. Right, that's eight years ago. So huh. I don't know what they're talking about in terms of uh, uh, shaders and stuff. It's just the 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 basic problem is just, is you, just, you have a bandwidth issue, You're at the, and and you ha you have to do extra tricks on the Xbox to get to, to work around that. Microsoft does give you a very much bandwidth between the you know, to get between the processor and the and the GPU basically. Um, and uh, so will will it solve? Will this solve it? Well, it, it depends on how much effort it requires. I mean, we're all talking theory right now. It really depends mm -hmm. on whether they solve the problem of making it a pain. If you're willing, to, right now, even without all this stuff, if you're willing, if you're a developer and you're willing to put in the work, you can run your have a ten your 1080p game. The question is, is whether it's worth that effort. I, as and while people on Twitter or on uh, various ga game sites will raise an uproar, the average person doesn't care if Madden is running at 720p or, or whatever. <laughs> they wouldn't even know, right? It could be. Right, it, right. It, they just don't know. So that's the and that's the problem that are all, we're always working against is that most people don't even care. So if it takes a bunch of money to development resources to do it, then. It's probably not going to happen, but the Microsoft is trying to solve it, and there's a decent chance it will. But we don't; we can only speculate. Yeah, uh, you know, we were talking about how uh, you know so many developers are adopting DX12, and and Microsoft came out and they showed all the partners that were willing to to use DX12. Um, what do you think about the adoption rate of of DX12, and what do you think uh, like what would keep a developer from not using DX12 and maybe using uh, DX11 or a, another platform to develop a game? Oh, there's, there's no reason. Um, I mean, if you're making a new game, DirectX 12 is better than DirectX 11 in every way. There's no reason at all. I mean, at <laughs> least with DirectX 9, I can say, well, I really want to get that. There's a lot of tools and stuff that make it easier to do DirectX uh, 9 out there. But what's going to ha as a practical matter... Microsoft has got Unity and Frostbite and um, Epic on board. They will take care of it, and everyone will use their engines, and adoption of DirectX 12, and Vulkan, for that matter, will be swift. Hmm. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, excited. And I assume I mean, that they have, you know, I, and I'm not as familiar with the PlayStation 4, but I mean, I'm sure they have GMN. It already does all that stuff anyway. Yeah, I mean, you just you hear so many people who are like, "Oh, well, Microsoft's gonna have to fight, you know, to get people to use DX12," and it's just like, why would they have to do that? Mm. You know, if if this is the that. newest platform, then it should automatically be. Well, adopted see, and, I don't understand. What, what was it, what's the argument on having to fight? Oh, we have this thing, and it it basically will make things way faster, and you don't really have to do very much work to do it. Uh, 
Why would you not use that? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd understand if you had to rewrite all your code, right, or, or something. Uh, but you know. you know what? I think as I think what it is is that gamers, um, do you look at two platforms? You have this Microsoft uh, API that's going to be released worldwide soon um, to a mass audience. Um, then you turn around and you have these other APIs in Mantle and Vulkan and uh, Vulkan being a open source um, project, a lot of people feel like that should be the main thing that is adopted, not DirectX 12. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why you have fans say, well, they're going to have to really, um, you know, who's going to adopt it? Because in, in some people's eyes, uh, I remember one developer said that, well, if somebody makes a game using DX12, um, then that's a, that's a choice of them not making a game for PlayStation 4. And I'm like, why? They used DX11 before. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. they used DX11 that, that's, before. Yeah, and Vulcan's they made a much games. bigger threat to... Oh, Vulcan doesn't help you on PlayStation 4. I asked them outright on that. I, and they said they don't really have any plans because Vulcan is still not is still higher level than GMN. Mm. Or uh, GN... Yeah, up... Uh, I always get it mixed up. Is it G N M or G? It's G N M. Yeah, G N M. Yeah, yeah. And so it's still higher level than that. Um, so I don't know if how much, but I I would still prefer Vulcan because I want to write one thing and it work on everything. Mm. Which, yeah. but Sony has no doesn't have a huge. That's not necessarily a good thing for Sony. They want you to write to their API to, so that they get a better performance, right? You don't want any sort of lowest common denominator kind of issues, right? right. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, Vulcan's a much bigger threat to uh, DirectX 12 than, I, than, say, using DirectX 11. The question the developer might be thinking is, why should I use DirectX 12 instead of just using Vulcan, which is Mantle? I mean, they're spelled oh. differently, and they probably have a different logo, but Vulcan's Mantle. <laughs> <laughs> the same. One in the same. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I, I, yeah it, it, if you've used Mantle, you've used Vulcan and vice versa. Um, but obviously, Mantle is for AMD cards, whereas... Um... DirectX 12 is universal, so I guess the appeal um, would be more a DirectX 12 favorite, yeah, especially being, being able, especially being able to uh, make the older cards more efficient. I think I think that really helps them having not to be able to go out and buy a brand new GPU, you know, for X amount of dollars. If you have a card that falls in line with these other cards that's on this list, um, your 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 GPU can, I'm um, excuse me, your CPU and the GPU can really get a nice boost from this uh, update. Oh yeah, but on the same time, Vulcan can make the argument of, uh, I get that, I can do run on the same cards, and I'll run on Windows Seven. Oh wow. And, oh, and I will run on the Mac, and I will run on Steambox and Linux. That is a pretty tough. That's going to be a tough uh, sell for some people. Now, I mean. For us, we're supporting both. I mean, it's 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 we're already doing DirectX 12. Well, we plan to do support DirectX 12. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we we've been using it. We like it. Um, we like Mantle a lot. We like all, we just love them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, Brad, I just had a question uh, as far as GDC. Um, you know, just recently happened. Um, what were your thoughts uh, as far as what Microsoft had said at GDC regarding DX12? Um, well, there's a they have some challenges. I mean, one of the reasons why, I, this, so this gets into the sausage factor that is the game industry, and so Microsoft, a lot of stuff is theory versus. You've heard me talk about like what's the difference between speculation and fact. So I was able to speak pretty openly on what DirectX 12 could do on a PC because as I'm talking to you, the monitor just next to me is just running a game on DirectX 12 at, you know, on a PC. <laughs> and right. so I, when, when people were going, well, he, didn't he say it would run five times faster? And it's like, I look at the monitor next to me, the director, yeah, it's five times faster, right? <laughs> I, but on the Xbox, no, there isn't a DirectX 12 enabled game yet. Right. And so no one knows. And so Microsoft's, well, you know, 10, 20, we don't know. And they don't because there isn't, and they wouldn't be. And here's the irony, though: it went for Ashes, Singularity, and uh, and Star Swarm. No one would know how much faster DirectX 12 is on the PC either, 
Or they'd be right. the same. They would be what? I mean, even at the show, and I'm not. I'm not here. I'm not bashing Microsoft, but if you, I and I like Fable. All right, the game, but that's not a demo. What is that? It doesn't show me anything, right? I mean, I want. Right. To, if I'm looking at DirectX 11 versus DirectX 12, I want to be able to look at the two and go, well, what's the difference? And the only other thing at the show that they had that was you actually using DirectX 12 to any extent was was Ashes of Singularity, and they were and they had a Fable booth next to it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we I've been able to because people were saying, well, why is Brad Wardell speaking so much about DirectX 12? And he isn't he an AI guy? And I am. I'm an AI guy, and not really a graphics guy. And the only reason I can is because we're the only ones with the direct. So far, we will be joined by many, many. Uh, people who are far more knowledgeable and talented than me, than I am, of uh, very soon, who are making DirectX 12 specific stuff. But right now, or at least certainly in this time, this yeah, you're window, one of the few that has you know a little bit of an advantage talking about it because you've been around it more. Right, ex exactly. Yeah. That's really the only difference. It's not like I have some special, unique, smart knowledge here. It's just that <laughs> I was the I happen to be the first one that's really using it, or we are. Stardock and Oxide are the first ones to really use it. Right, right. I think the whole point with the Fable thing was the boost, the GPU boost, which wasn't expected. Uh, at least I wasn't expecting it. Um, one of the things that you know the team and I talked about on one of our shows was that um, when Phil was doing the press conference and they, this is when they announced that they were going to do the. Um, was it the crossplay at this event? Did they, did they announce crossplay at this event with the yeah. surface? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, yeah. so, so once they announced crossplay and they brought Fable up and said Fable will be for PC, um, and then one of the things that they started to show you was the difference of what Fable was like running on DX11 and what Fable was like running on DX12. And when it hit DX12, it got a twenty percent increase on the GPU side, which made it go from nine hundred p to ten eighty p. And, you know, one of the things that I said during that show was that even if even if we don't know, and, and this is my opinion, even if we don't know what is going to happen on the Xbox One, I believe that that same thing would happen on the Xbox One because that was a DX11 game. That game releasing probably would have been 900p on the Xbox One when it launched. And it being ported over to DX12, because I remember you also said a while back that a lot of games coming out this year will just be kind of like ported over, not really built from the ground up on it. Um, so I already knew that Fable wasn't a built from the ground up game. Um, but once it gets ported over, I think that will get a significant boost as well on the GPU side as far as resolution is concerned. Um, even though the games that you know most people say need to be CPU bound, they did something GPU-wise with the DX12, maybe some type of tool or something that actually helped that game get its full resolution out, which to me was kind of impressive. Yeah. Well, I know one of the things coming up, too, that's... Uh, now, so Microsoft, the next big DirectX 12, this, the other foot, falls uh, at the Build Conference, which is later this month. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be a PC-only DirectX 12. Sorry, that won't, won't, affect, it won't mean anything for consoles. But right. it's, we're going to be showing... Um, Ashes of Singularity there as well at the, at the Microsoft booth. Or, at, or well, okay, nice. well, actually at the sessions. There's not a booth because it's, it's built. Uh, that's their developers conference. But it'll, the thing that they're adding in the DirectX 12 is one of those things that's, again, here's the irony, is that once it's in, and I can't talk about it yet, but what's really horrifying is that once you see what they're doing, you go, son of a bitch. They should have been doing this this should have been in DirectX 11 and 10 and 9. It's like, it's so, <laughs> duh. And it, it's embarrassing. Uh. And, 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 I mean, I'm glad it's in DirectX 12. But it's also one of those, I, I alluded to this recently when I was talking to someone, um, that they're in this tough marking spot because some of the things they're doing, they can't, They on the one hand, they want to talk about loudly, like, uh, uh, yeah, look, at DirectX 12 is true multi-core, multi right? Mm -hmm. And without, but with, how do you do that without acknowledging? And by the way, DirectX 11 and before was not using your other cores, right? <laughs> right? And, right, and that's right. a very awkward discussion to have. And uh, I can do that because I'm a loudmouth. But um, <laughs> but this other thing makes that even look more ridiculous. Mm. 
that they're doing. Everyone's gonna, there's gonna be, I think, there will be. Everyone's gonna be really glad about it, and I don't think anyone's gonna be mad. But I've already seen Microsoft like it, been in meetings for, and I'm, I'm under none, any no. The only thing I'm under NDA about is I can't actually tell you what the feature right. is, other than right. to say. It's so obvious in hindsight that people go, well, why didn't DirectX 11 do this? Hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, it's a good thing that at least they're doing it now rather than later. At least they're finally getting it. So Yeah. And you're talking about basically flipping a switch and everybody, it's an art thing that will make DirectX 12 uh, blatantly like a must-have for gamers, is that they flip the switch and, and, and developers don't even really have to do any real work on it. And they, you get a twenty percent boost. Boom! Wow! Right, right. Boom! <laughs> wow! Yeah, that's crazy. Man. I'm just like just wondering how that's gonna translate over to console. I'm just gonna. Keep it will it not right. translate at all to console. It's not relevant. Gotcha. Not relevant at all. Okay. Not no, relevant. it won't do any. This this particular feature won't. Gotcha. All right. Good to know. But yeah, the, no, the part on that know. is relevant <laughs> to direct uh, to the console is that in DirectX 11, even though. I mean, it is it is a very low level API, but it still serializes a lot of calls to the uh, the uh, AMT part. I think has um, GPU has uh, twelve. Oh, I'm going off the top of my head. Twelve cores, mm -hmm. and I think the call from these AMD CPU side is is serial it gets serialized still going out to those cores, which is not ideal. Whereas in DirectX twelve, it, it it can be a parallel. So all the core there's eight cores which you get access to like depending on who you're arguing with, five or six, on the CPU side. And you guys know what, into, uh, what all this is? There's a cores on the CPU, and then there's basically what we call cores, or whatever. there's a different term on the, on the GPU. But there's, mm -hmm. like, uh, there's like 12 on the GPU side of things, and then there's like five or, or six, depending on who you're arguing with, right. on the CPU side. Right. And on DirectX yeah. 11... Those five core, those five cores. We'll just say there's five for argument's sake. They can make calls to the GPU, but ultimately they're serialized together, and then they're sent out, and then they're re, they're split up at some point by DirectX 11 to go out to those 12 cores. But in DirectX 12, the developer can actually go and say, no, 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 no. I'm calling all the core. I my all five of my cores are going to talk to, you know, at least. You know, Obviously, a perfect parallelism is five of those GPUs at once, or split it off into to all twelve at once. I mean, I wow. GPUs, of course. Right. And again, I apologize because so, I'm not a graphics guy in terms of the terminology. I'm, I, the GPU side of thing, they tend to call their cores something else. You know, logical right. process. I don't know what they are. Well, you know, if we have anybody out there. Um, that's on the GPU side listening to the show. By all means, come on Tick Podcast if you feel that you could explain it a little bit better. But I mean, Brad, listen, man, I appreciate. Yeah, I think it's uh, the twelve computing. I I remember now, twelve compute units. Right, twelve compute units. Correct. Yeah, you know, I I appreciate you coming on the show. You don't have you don't have to. I mean, we're an Xbox centric show, but you come on, you explain things the best way that you can to the yeah. Xbox fan base. Yeah, we appreciate that. We really do. We're we're yeah. a passionate fan base, and um, you know, we only care about gaming in general. We care about gamers, but we also care about the Xbox One platform and you know how it's evolving, what direction it's going, what could. It we, you know, what could yeah. we see happen in the future? And, and with crossplay, we're we're learning to embrace PC a little more. It looks like going yeah, forward I, in the future. I, I, well, it, we I, talked I, about this last time too. Is that I mean, all the both these guys, both PlayStation Four, Xbox One. I mean, right now they're at they're at the you forget they're at the beginning. Do you remember how crappy the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty games looked like when they first came out? Mm -hmm. And people, that we went. Through, it's amazing. Everyone, no one has any memory anymore. Of I don't know why you get Xbox 360. The games look no better than they're just playing Xbox, right? And right. it's like here we are again. The Xbox One comes out. I don't know why you get an Xbox One. Uh, the games look just like that. like. Yeah, well, that's because the games are basically ports. But give it a give it a little bit of time, and they're going to be something insane. I mean, you are talking about eight gigabytes of memory you're playing with, and eight cores, and you know a pretty decent uh, hardware on both of them. Right. Yeah, I, you know the fans are just getting a frenzy. <laughs> they yeah. just get into frenzy. Really, yeah, they should really be all weird. partying. I mean, that's the thing. I, I look at these people who are just so angry, <laughs> and it's like, no, the, our, my console's crap. It's like, no, your console's really good. Uh, 
<laughs> so what? I mean, your your console was what three hundred dollars, and you got all this stuff, and it's gonna, and because the market's so big, and the optimization and the tools are so. Oh, that's another thing people forget. It's how much better the tools are nowadays than back in the day. Right. And we're not doing assembly mm-hmm. language crap. Um, it's they're just gonna be so awesome. The games are just gonna be so awesome. Yeah. And they're Please. already they're already getting there. You're already starting to see the. Uh, I mean, not necessarily the game quality, but like a PlayStation 4 just got the blood, the uh, blood, Bloodborne. Thank you, yeah. Bloodborne. Mm-hmm. I mean, that looks pretty amazing. Right. Yeah, it's critically. Uh, yeah, it's critically acclaimed. Yeah, sure. It's uh, one of the highest rated games out there. Um, yeah. You know, I think that Microsoft is is going in in a direction that most companies are going. It's another touchy subject that we talk about. Obviously, is now you have these major companies the three big companies starting to do things with pcs and tablets and uh you know we had jeff Keeley on the other day and he brought up something where it was like you know the the, the phones and the tablets uh upgrade so fast with their hardware that soon you'll be playing console like games on your phones and tablets if not already and it's getting harder he feels this is the reason why I think in Japan the mobile space is so big. Um, it's getting harder um, for consoles to not upgrade sooner. You know, doing yeah. the ten-year life cycle, doing the eight-year life cycle. But what we really interesting is if the next iteration they came out of the slim console had the right stuff, maybe a better GPU, maybe a better CPU, maybe you know the the right things in these consoles um and then you sell it at a at a solid price and then you make the fans um you know kind of like upgrade like you would upgrade a phone you take your console in they take two three hundred dollars off mm-hmm. you pay 200 you get the console back and you got this spanking brand new console but it's still the xbox one yeah it's you just know? the newest version right what are your what are your thoughts on that do you think that's that's a solid idea or that I bet you it's been thought of. I bet you there's someone at Microsoft <laughs> right now who's going, God damn, the connect. <laughs> right? Because, I mean, you just oh, think of how much, how many decisions were made because of that stupid peripheral. And uh, oh. it's like, if they just, like, why didn't we do the 18 computing units? Like, the, you know, because the PS4 has 18 instead of 12, which is nice. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we had DDR5, which nowadays costs like nothing and right uh if they did those two things then they went there would be no sram debate at all right right it would be yeah. of course at that point they're the same <laughs> they're the same machine they're the same machine right they're the same, same machine, machine. Exactly. all right okay. with one at least on hardware wise the difference is of course is that with, if you're developing for microsoft the tools and the other goodies are just so much nicer yeah i mean i'm just waiting to see what this whole cloud tech stuff is about um i've reached yeah. out to the guys over um the crackdown developers um a while back and they said they weren't ready to talk about it but i'm pretty sure um i might be able to get them Uh. to talk about cloud tech eventually um but you know one of the things that microsoft talks about is cloud tech and how that is supposed to help with offloading stuff um with these move engines being able to offload resources to the cloud and be able to use more of the hardware for other things so that that's a possibility Oh, I don't absolutely. know how that works, but that's oh, it's, a possibility it's actually it helps. really straightforward if you think about. It. Let's take let's take away the CPU aspect. That's a little f- fuzzier. Okay. Have you ever thought you had Xbox 360? Did you do you know the yeah. specs on the DVD drive that was in it? No. Have you ever thought about how how f- slow the DVD drive in that thing was? I, I would love someone should like uh, as part of your podcast someone put the specs of the Xbox 360 DVD drive in terms of its transfer rate. But I guarantee it's something really <laughs> pathetic. I mean, pathetic. Hmm. And uh, uh, it's way slower than your bro- a good, decent broadband connection. Hmm. So all of a sudden, I'm making a game. And like, why, if I want to have, I could have this incredible virtual world that I'm in. Why would I store this in a, uh, just on, and, and especially if I want to procedurally generate it. Because I, so I'm not just talking about data like, a, a you know an MMO or something like that. I'm talking about where I'm having some serious uh, procedural generation being done. Why not just do that offsite? Why does it have to be done on your machine? Right, right, makes sense. I mean, Siri. Uh, 
for better or worse, is is all cloud based on your Apple, hmm. on your iPhone. I think people just worry about, uh, you know, what what is it going to do overall? Um, like graphically, can it can it send things back and forth? I think the biggest issue people are concerned with is bandwidth. You know, how much bandwidth is it going to take to send this information? Uh, you know, lightning fast to the servers, back to your console um, to render the next scene. Oh, it's not an on-live. I don't think they're talking about doing on-live. I'm talking about uh, using it more like the way you'd use um, in the old days, like you're playing Halo and you're... you're uh, how many times in a game where you're going, you get to the end of a thing and it's loading... Oh, God, what game was it? There'd be... Well, Fable or whatever, and it's, you just see it loading from the stupid DVD drive or whatever. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and so that it, you could just have that coming in from the cloud, which it would actually be way faster to do it that right. way. I mean, right. Obviously, the best way would be having a big solid state drive, but um, I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon. And well, then, like I, think... I said, you can and and the data that's being sent to you could be done procedurally, so you can end up with a lot more uh, sophistication than what yeah. you have today. Like in the MMO, I mean. You go back and play any MMO World of Warcraft or whatever. I mean, that's a case of it's done on the cloud, but it's not procedural. It's a pre-made map. Right. Well, it's funny that you say that because there was a dev. I think he might be working on Crackdown. He doesn't really give his name up. Um, that was on Gaff. And one of the things he talked about was developing this game um, where... If it was running off the cloud, it was dynamic. And if it was running off the disc, it was static and it was a pain in the butt to do. But when you see the game, it is beyond impressive. Like you would, you know, the character could step in the grass. The footprint would be in the grass. Whatever direction the wind is blowing in the game, the water would flow in that direction. Like all these things are happening. While if you suddenly were offline, you wouldn't get those same effects. I don't know how true that is because we don't know much about the cloud. Um, and I, and I yeah. understand that. That's why Microsoft has kind of been hush-hush about it. You haven't heard them talk about it lately. But I think one of the things that they boast about is that, yeah, that is a possibility that that's going to be realistic and true. And um, I can't wait to see what Crackdown looks like because this is supposed to be their <laughs> first cloud game. I'm really oh, excited no, to see it. But just just say, for example, if they're able to offload physics from the console to the cloud and get those calculations back and forth, um, you know, at, at the at the right time while playing the game without you noticing and able to use more of the the compute of the of the hard drive. I mean, excuse me, the the resources in the Xbox one to offload to something else like the GPU. I wonder how effective that would be or if that's even possible well you're well one of the things that a lot of people i think the problem a lot of people are having is that they're thinking of everything in terms of real time oh how are they gonna get that frame back that's not how you use the cloud that's not the point the point mm. is is that there's a lot of background cpus let, let me give a really simple example of ultimate let's go let's really dumb it down a chess program okay it would be way more efficient if I right now chess can be done on a is a chess AI is so simple that you wouldn't ever put that in the cloud at this point. So let's, but it's you get the idea. Pretend that we're doing the ultimate chess AI, right? It's sentient. It's it's gonna. In fact, it's gonna enslave you when you if you lose, and that is something that you would offload what it's gonna do onto the cloud because it could do it. You have all those hardware computing resources that aren't available on your console, mm-hmm. and then the console is left to just do the rendering, right? It doesn't. Right. It isn't using up two of the cores doing AI and another core doing the putting together the physics and all this other stuff. Now, obviously, in a chess program, it's, it's too simple. But mm-hmm. I'm, holy cow, I can think of endless numbers of things where it's hard to imagine now because we're so used to if every game is just a simple beat em up game you don't need the cloud for that but if I'm trying to do something where I want to make a really living breathing world experience like an RPG with mm-hmm. the, like uh, the next Skyrim type game right. the, co- the cloud becomes pretty darn interesting for that hmm. not for rendering a real time I'm not rendering my frames I want my console to do the rendering and the, that stuff I'm talking about for doing the simulation part which does not have to be real time right yeah, I think that's just one of those things where, like, 
gamers just didn't understand. You know, sometimes things just have to be black and white for gamers to kind of understand. It's got to be dumbed down, you know, and, and as simple as possible for them to understand what the tech is actually doing. Because um, so many people were confused, like, oh, well, you know, if I lose connection, then then what happens to the cloud-based game? Or well, if the cloud-based game would stop. Here, here, let me give you a real, like, another example. Um, there's a, one of the, the most popular game on the PC right now is called City Skylines, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's it's really good. But imagine if uh, it's limited based on the hardware, right? How big can the city get? Well, it depends. you know, there's only so much memory for destroying the entire simulation. There's so much CPU power for dealing with the simulation. But if you were, if that was a cloud-based game. You could off be offloading huge. You could have it be a whole planet that you're you're simulating, right? Wow. And and the, the, you only have to render and worry about the part you're actually looking at that moment. But their whole simulation could be offloaded, and that's obviously not. No one's got is going to notice. So, oh, what's your ping time? You know, 200 milliseconds. Let's say if it's crappy. Oh no, it's a fifth of a second to get back the fact you know, whether this building is upgraded <laughs> to the next level on its own, right? No one's going to care, right? You can right. have a two-second lag and no one would notice. Right, right, right. Yo, no, it's um, it's a very interesting design Microsoft chose uh, with their console, um, and and the resources that they plan to use in the future with Cloud Tech DX12. Um, so I think a lot of fans are excited to see what the future holds for them. But they get it not. for free. I mean, Microsoft's <laughs> yeah. already... No, I mean, I'm saying Microsoft, because they're doing Azure, right? They're doing all this stuff for their enterprise stuff anyways. Right, And so right. this just... We're, Starlock is using Azure for its Tachyon project, which is not doing cloud computing, per se. Well, it is and it isn't. And that we run our... We're going to be running the game state. When people play multiplayer, we want the games to run on um, servers so that players aren't having lag when they're playing each other and you get rid of the cheating issue because they're never touching each other. Right. Um, and that's where the Azure is actually, uh, you know, the game is actually running on Microsoft's cloud. Mm. Right. So, I mean, that's not, it's not some weird feature. I hear people saying, oh, that's just a fat thing. It's like, well, we're doing it right now for our PC games. Now, not in the way that they're talking, but yeah, our games are executing on a cloud machine and sending back the results to multiple PCs so that the game they're playing, so in this case, let's say Azure is a singularity, right? The, the simulation is running on this machine that's offloaded, um, and actually the one that they're, we're doing it on first is going to be called uh, Servo. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's an RTS, but the, the game state's running off, off site, and then the players can, are playing on there, and that way they don't have to worry about what someone's doing map hacking or any of the other stuff, you know, BS that we've traditionally had with these games. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, before we get out of here, just got a one more question. Um, Brandon, before I ask mine, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, I think I'm good, man. I just want to, you know, say thanks to Brad again. Appreciate you coming back on the show, man. And uh, hope to get you back on later on in the year after we see what DX12 uh, is doing for Xbox. Yeah, I, I would be happy to come on after uh, Build in particular because uh, that's going to be that's gonna be pretty fun. I hope you'll see what they're doing. <laughs> Awesome. That'd be really cool. Um, Brad, so obviously Ashes, you guys are working on that right now. Um, now, I, now, from what I understand, I heard those that that particular game is running on some heavy, heavy, top-notch hardware GPUs. Do you think that game is possible to be ported to, to Xbox? No. Not even, no. No way. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that doesn't mean... Uh, I mean, we but we do plan to bring Star Control over, right? And that's oh. going to be uh, pretty amazing looking. It just won't have eight thousand units running at the same time. With uh, I, I just in terms of terrain. Ironically, if Microsoft does get this cloud stuff working, it a lot of things become possible. Here's an, all right. There's your example. Here's your cloud example. <laughs> so why is it? Why, why can't we have ashes? Well, one of the example reasons why we can't do it is. The uh, train, the reason why the train looks amazing is that it's procedurally generated. It's not like we have this map editor that we paint the maps. Like, you know, and your traditional RTS, whether it be uh, Supreme Commander or um, StarCraft or whatever, there's, an, there's someone who sits down and paints up the map. But in Ashes, we, 
they're procedurally generated. So it, it simulates erosion and cliffs and the mountains and, and vegetation and all this. And it is, it's so nasty that we actually have to throw it onto the GPU because it mm. has so much parallelism in there. But we couldn't do that on a console. It would, you would be sitting there for like 30 minutes to get into the game. But wow. on a PC, it's only like seconds. Right, right. So, but if we can offload that to the cloud, because the actual file it generates is only like a megabyte. <laughs> it's mm. not as tiny. Right. Wow. That's an interesting concept. I think Microsoft has something special. We're just waiting for it to happen. It's unfortunate that we have to wait so long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's always the same. I mean, if one goes looks at the end of the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3 generation and goes back, well, didn't they re-release uh, one of the Halo games at the end of the Xbox 360 era? And you go, oh, oh my yeah, God, this is so much nicer. Yeah, than anniversary, a- yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, Brad, man, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for stopping in, chatting with us, talk about uh, your game. GDC and we look forward yeah man we'll, we'll try to get you back on after Bill we always have great discussions with you um, and we could talk about uh, you know what's happening with Win 10 DX12 and for PC I know we got some new PC followers out there or some guys that are PC Xbox so uh, we could talk about that and get a, under, a better understanding of what's happening on the PC side of things for Windows 10 because um, I really think that Microsoft um, even though I'm not a fan of the whole exclusives going to PC um, I, I do understand why they're doing it but I think that in at the same in the same token the fact that they have that application where you could port the universal app where you could just port a game from PC to Xbox in like no time at all um, that's gonna open up a lot of games for the Xbox platform oh that, yeah you no know, that naturally just would have been on PC so that's that's a very interesting concept and, and very quickly the game you just said that um you were planning to bring star control would you would you make that a dx12 port oh yeah that's gonna be direct x12 okay awesome well that's awesome to hear um yeah, it uses it's, it's using the same engine as uh it's ashes oh, okay okay cool would that would that be like a cross play title that'd be really cool if it was a cross play title oh i don't know i mean i i'm not sure what that's supposed to mean i mean other than um like PC and Xbox integrated, you know, is there like a multiplayer or anything like that where we can all be in the same world or have a Well, that's, that's the plan. We definitely want people to be battling their spaceships across different platforms. I mean, that's kind of the whole the whole point. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Brad. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again. Sounds good. Talk to you guys later. For the fans, by the fans. Mm-hmm.